Where did Christianity originate? Was it in the synagogues of Jerusalem? Or in the caves at Qumran and the palaces of the Herods? Today, on the Exodus Project, we uncover the fingerprints of the Essenes and Herods in history and the New Testament. back everyone this is another episode of the exodus project i'm your host steve eisenhower i trust all of you had a happy and healthy hanukkah if you celebrate um today we are going to discuss the origins of christianity um a topic i've been studying for quite a while it's um very deep very interesting topic and i've amassed quite a bit of some relevant findings um, but before we get started hit that subscribe button turn on the notifications give me a big thumbs up um, please check the description for any resources you may need um, and let's get right into it all right the true origins of christianity so this map as seen on the right hand side of the screen is directly from the Cultural Backgrounds Study Bible. It's a Christian product, um, but it shows us a couple things. And the first thing I would like to really point out here is, first of all, that it shows that Jesus' upper room for the Last Supper, as well as the area where the 120 at Pentecost received the Holy Spirit, according to Acts, that this was actually in the Essene quarter. Isn't that interesting? In the Essene quarter. Let me see if I can... Right here. Let's see if I can make a mark on it here. The Essene quarter. Okay. So the Essene Quarter housed about 50 Essene Koyhanim, which means priests, um, that they may have lived in the southwestern corner of Jerusalem, shown on the right here, between 30 BCE and 70 CE, which is the destruction of the temple. They were mostly celibate. The Kohanim, the Essene Koyhanim, adhered to purity laws far stricter than those followed by the Jerusalem temple priests. Okay? This would make sense um, with what we see in the... with what we see in the Gospels. Um, if there is an Essene connection to Jesus, uh, when we see that Jesus teaches... when we do see that Jesus teaches the law, he often makes it more stringent, right? That you can't even look at a woman in lust or you've already committed adultery or you can't get angry and you, if you get angry, you've already murdered somebody. Um, these things. So we actually see a almost incomprehensible and un, unmanageable standard according to Jesus' outlook on the law, which would match that of the Kohanim right? Of the Essenes. So the fact that Jesus is some of the most important traditional locations for his last supper at Passover or where the 120 later disciples 
received the Holy Spirit, according to Acts 2, uh, it's very interesting that this happened in the Essene quarter. So let's move on. And something else interesting, and we're going to get to it later on in the presentation, is I would like to have everyone realize that right here is Herod's palace, almost right next to, you know, where all these uh, things were going to be occurring with Jesus's cohorts. And also, I want everyone to keep in mind this Tower of Mariumne, okay, which is located right here. Also, relatively close. So let's move. Let's move on. Okay, there were exclusive people who abstained from temple worship in... This is describing the Essenes. They were an exclusive people who abstained from temple worship in Jerusalem and believed in the soul living on in the afterlife. The Essenes were also known for voluntary living in poverty and performing water purification rituals. That comes from artsci.uc.edu. You can check the if you'd like to read the article yourself. Um, but something interesting I would like to tease out here just a little bit. Uh, Jesus flips the flips the tables in the temple, right? Basically insinuating that there is corruption, that it's not working the way it's supposed to, right? The Olivet Discourse. Another idea that the temple is corrupt. Um, this would align very closely to how the Essenes felt. They There were many, maybe not many, but multiple communities of Essenes living outside of the city, for example, Qumran. And they basically made the community into a new temple because they felt that the temple was defiled. So in Jesus, quote-unquote, cleansing the temple, that's very, very much congruent to how the Essenes would have felt. Um, so to continue on, I'm about to quote from an article called Messianic Hymns, a Self-Glorified and Suffering Messiah in Essene Theology by Dr. M. D. McGee, where he writes, The Messianic Hymns date to the end of the reign of Herod, which is right around the time of Jesus, of course, as the New Testament would purport, when the Christian Messiah was born. The figure in the self-glorification hymn is the Messiah, but the first person account makes the author tantamount to God. Besides self-glorification is a confession of enduring suffering, echoing the suffering servant of Isaiah. Servants of God in heaven were angels, on earth priests, Kohanim, when faithful, living angels. About 50 Essene Kohanim lived in the Essene quarter of Jerusalem between 30 BC and 70 AD. So here we have nearly exact scholarly understanding of where and when the Essenes were operating. They were celibate and had stricter purity laws than those of the Jerusalem temple priests. Essenes were faithful servants who had suffered wrongly, and the suffering servant could be an Essene interpolation specifically of the experience of an Essene leader about 30 years before the crucifixion. These hymns suggest that the Qumran community had identified the J Jewish Messiah with God and with the suffering servant before the Christian churches had done. Now this is very interesting, people. I want you to realize this that Essene theology and their outlook on Judaism as a whole was very mystical, um, very Enochian. Uh, really, their theological understanding was outside that of Torah normative Judaism. Um, so here we see that from their sectarian literature, these messianic hymns, is where we find really the genesis of the suffering Messiah, the suffering servant as being exclusively a suffering Messiah, as well as a divine Messiah. Um, and this is, you know, years, years and years before the church ever would have, ever would have grabbed a hold of these ideas. So his, his culminative statement here is that the church reflected an already existing Essene theology. So that's very, very, very interesting. Um, that if from Judaism at all, it's from a more or less mystical, heretic, heretical version of it that was adhering to 
the Book of Enoch. I mean, the Book of Enoch is in, was found in Qumran more than anything else, more than any other book. Um, and if you if you speak with, oftentimes more mystical, sects of Christianity, they really venerate the Book of Enoch and understand its uh, angelology and demonology and its cosmology, etc. And according to Torah Judaism, that was a book that wasn't meant to be read. It was heretical and could really breed heresy. And that's exactly what it did. So to find that the Essenes as well as the Christians are, you know, really getting their worldview from that literature, this dualistic, um, this dualistic, Hellenistic, really separate worldview from that of Pharisaic Torah Judaism it goes to show a lot. So I think just in this one little paragraph from this article, we're already learning so much about the connection of apocalyptic Judaism, uh, really the tabooness of the Jerusalem temple at the time, and how Christianity's worldview, Christianity's theology, is running congruent, actually being predated by Essene theology. So it's it's clear that it was, you know, adopted as the church, as the church uh, grew and went along. Okay, so this is from Josephus, Antiquities Book 13. The sect of the Essenes declares that fate is the mistress of all things, and that nothing befalls men unless it be in accordance with her decree. So fate... Uh, very much tied with Greek the uh, Greek mythology, Greek theology, Hellenism. Uh, we do understand that the Essenes were birthed from the Tzedukim, uh the Sadducees, as a hyper mystical almost version of it, and you know we we already went into how they separate them so themselves from the temple, practice celibacy much as the church early church would adopt. Um, self-imposed poverty as the church would adopt. So many congruencies, parallels. Um, but here, this one's very telling, is that they did not believe in free will. So we're going to read the next, which is um, actually from a sectarian writing found at Qumran. Before things come to be, God has ordered all their designs. This is an Essene sectarian writing. So that when they do come to exist at their appointed times as ordained by his glorious plan, they fulfill their destiny. A destiny impossible to change. He created humanity, humankind to rule over the world, appointing them for, for them two spirits in which to walk until the time ordained for his visitation. These are the spirits of truth and falsehood. Upright character and fate originate with the habitation of light, perverse with the fountain of darkness. It is actually he who created the spirits of light and darkness, making them the cornerstone to every deed. So as you see here, a very dualistic, good versus evil understanding, good versus evil worldview. This is straight up, straight up Jewish dualism, good versus evil theology, not monotheism, that everything is from Hashem, right? And he created evil to be an exacting, an exactation of our free will giving us a second choice because uh, we do understand in normative Judaism the idea uh, the, the the point of view of the Tanakh of the Torah is that we are presented with a choice good and evil life and death choose good choose life that you may live um, and that is what makes us righteous not that yes of course we understand that Hashem has foreknowledge uh, but he does give us Bahira right he gives us free will not that we are simply from this understanding is very Greek that the creator created the world and spun it into oblivion and that fate has everything that there's a idea of predestination they they believed in a predestination theology that the sons of light were ordained to be the sons of light and everyone else is the sons of darkness and ultimately that cannot be changed right as they say a destiny impossible to change so here I'm actually going to quote from Catholic.com. So I'm quoting directly from a Orthodox Christian source. It says, At the time of Christ, some Jews, such as the Essenes, thought that everything is fated by God to happen, 
so that people have no free will. As I said, what is predestination? That's the article on catholic.com. Um, check it out if you, if you feel the need to look into that further. But very clearly, these understandings and these theologies were not born from Torah Judaism, um, and they were much more of the Hellenistic mind. Uh, but what's interesting is they did not believe in free will. They believed in, a, in an idea of predestination, that everything is pre-fated. And this actually runs congruent with Paul's theology, as we find in Romans 8.29, where he says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Verse 30, And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Insinuating that because of God's foreknowledge, he already, he really didn't give free will, preservation of the saints. You know, uh, Calvinism really ran with this. Um, they certainly adhere to predestination. That really there is no free will. It, it takes foreknowledge and doesn't factor in Bahira. Right, so it really doesn't believe in free will. That simply things are impossible to change. If you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to believe in Jesus, that's always been preordained. You had no choice in the matter, um, and therefore, because of that, you were justified and ultimately glorified in Jesus. So very similar, very similar to the Essene theology of sons of light versus sons of darkness. So once again, peering through at every turn in the Christian Bible and their theology, we're seeing these tropes that have already been occurring in, you know, sectarian, really heretical, apocalyptic Judaism. Essenite ideology. This is from worldhistory.org. Okay. The literature of this period included seers who had out-of-body experiences of being taken on tours of heaven and where they were shown the secrets of the final days, usually by angels. As part of the Essene theology and practice, they separated themselves from the majority of Jews to await God's final intervention. So that's asceticism, right? Com uh, communal living, uh, really creating the first monasteries, more or less, which is, like I said, the church adhered to that, and celibacy very, very, very heavily. Um, they also really venerated the mikveh, I think I was reading that they would go to mikvah multiple times a day, which we could understand that, you know, Christian baptism and the weight put on Christian baptism could really be from the Essene understanding of how important their idea of the mikvah was. While replicating many of the teachings of the prophets, the views of the Essenes were more radical in that everything was understood within the polarity of good or evil. So there we go. Think of Christian dualism, right? Uh, the evil devil is the staunch enemy to the good God, and they are really in war for our souls. Um, and this is evident in the following aspects of Essene thought. The first being chronological dualism and ethical dualism, unlike Torah Judaism, which is ethical monotheism. Um... Christianity, you could say, is also an ethical dualism of uh, following Jesus, you know, there, and rejecting the works of the devil, right? There are certainly, I mean, the Pentecostal movement, the evangelical movement, I know Catholics are very much into good works, that you resist... You resist the works of the devil as the staunch enemy of God, and you try to do the things that God would have you to do. Right? That's ethical dualism. Two, the conviction that history is predestined. We just read Paul in Romans. Um, very much a congruency. Also, the demonization of others. Sons of light versus sons of darkness theology. Um, In-group versus out-group. This is very prevalent in super conservative, hyper conservative Christianity. Um, I can speak to that from personal experience in the Pentecostal movement. If you aren't a Pentecostal, you aren't saved. 
right? You're going straight to hell and you're, you know, you're of the devil, right? And we even see in the Christian Bible the demonization of other Jews, that if you aren't, if you aren't a believer in Christ, then you are of the synagogue of Satan, right? You are of your father, the devil, you know, the father of lies, etc. The Essenes believe that human efforts, no matter how, how well intended, could not avert the coming disaster or influence, influence God to change his mind. Consider salvation in a Christian mindset is no matter what you do, you are always a filthy sinner, and you cannot change that, only the blood of Jesus can. There was no time for repentance. A person's fate had already been determined. This is right out of the book Calvinism. They also developed a process known as the demonization of others who do not agree with the Essenes. Very common in Christianity. Their literature contains some of the earliest polemics that the rest of humanity, including other Jews, are under the influence of the agents of the devil. This is Essene theology. This isn't Christian theology, but it's very, very similar. Think, I can only really speak for the Pentecostal movement, but Pentecostal movement is very fundamentalist, um, and it normally goes for every other movement that they feel this way, that they are right and everyone else is wrong, and everyone else is a heresy, and therefore influenced by you know, diabolical, demonic forces. So this this was already already being purported as early as you know over a you know probably close to a century before Jesus even existed 30 BCE so at least 60 years or at least um 30 plus years before Jesus even existed as the Christian Bible would suggest you already have good versus evil dualistic theology which predates the Essenes, of course, but um, definitely was adapted and hyper-practiced by these Essenes. And it definitely bled into Christianity very much so. And the whole Christian Bible is really polemics. So to find that some of the earliest polemical literature against humanity is being you know, demonic was in these Essene sectarian writings. It's becoming more and more clear where the theology was of the Christian religion was really birthed. So we see that Jesus and his followers may have had a very tight connection with this outlying Enochian priestly sect, which corroborates that we can deduce that John the Baptizer was an Essene. Based upon his garb, asceticism, and pedigree of his priestly father, one of the only men in the New Testament called holy righteous according to the Torah. Further, John baptizes Jesus, and in Luke, the Lord's Prayer is a direct quote by Jesus of John the Baptist. Luke 11, 11. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, and then so on goes into the Lord's Prayer, a truncated version of it. So which is very interesting. Um, why would his disciples ask him to teach them how to pray as John taught his disciples, unless Jesus was in fact a disciple of John? So the Lord's Prayer should actually be called John the Baptist's Prayer. Right? We understand that he was segregating himself out in the wilderness, um, very much venerated the idea of water cleansing for repentance. Um, so I'm not the first person to make the connection that John the Baptist certainly, I mean, his father was also a priest, right? Um, and is really given the honor of being called completely blameless according to the law. So... It's interesting. We could, we can. I'm not the first person to make the connection that John the Baptist might have been or probably was an Essene. So now I'm going to talk about the Mandeans. They are the traditional followers of John the Baptist. So in addition to the Gnostic basis that they possess, the Mandeans revere John the Baptist as one of their most important prophets. They claim that he was a Mandean, along with the Old Testament prophets of Adam, Abel, Seth, and Enoch. However, they consider Jesus a deceiver. 
Essenism is characterized as an early form of Jewish gnosis, and that's citing W. Bauer. Mandean cosmology. The world of light is the primeval transcendent world from which the Tibble and the world of darkness emerged. The great life, Chai Rabbi, or Supreme God, or the Monad, and his Uthras dwell in the world of light. So keep in mind that world of light. The Essenes thought themselves to be the holy elect of Israel, a.k.a. the sons of light, who would at the end of time engage in a catastrophic war with the enemies of Israel, the sons of darkness, a.k.a. everyone else. And that's from Britannica. World of Light, Sons of Light. We're seeing very, very, very interesting congruencies between the traditional religion, which consider themselves the direct followers of John the Baptist, their Gnostic theology, as well as this early Jewish Gnostic sect, the Essenes, and their theology, Sons of Light versus Sons of Darkness. Right? The world of light is the good. The world of darkness is the evil, and according to Mandean cosmology, the Essenes, sons of light versus sons of darkness, so much congruence in this Gnostic idea, and really gives credence to the idea that John the Baptist was an Essene. We see Jesus' disciples' clear understanding that Jesus was a disciple of John himself. He again confirms this by stating that, of all men born of women, Jesus included, John was the greatest. Luke 7, 28, I tell you, among, of, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So what does that mean? He's once again giving honor to John. Um, he himself was born of a woman, of course, but yet John is the greatest born of woman. But what is what is he then saying about the least in the kingdom of God? So, the understanding is that the kingdom of God, the coming of the kingdom, was imminent. So, John never got to see it. He was killed, according to the Gospels. He was, he was killed, clearly, before Jesus, and clearly before the coming of the kingdom. Um, so, he wasn't there to see the kingdom come, as, you know, Jesus and his disciples were understanding that it was imminent and coming in their time. So, what he's saying is that those who are alive to see the kingdom come, even the least of them is greater than someone who has succumbed in the present world. That's what's being stated there, but it's giving credence to Jesus actually being a disciple of John and giving such great honor that he is, in fact, the greatest prophet, as the Mandeans understand once again, that congruency with Essene, Essene Gnostic theology. Further, Josephus states that Menachem, an Essene high priest, had prophesied that Herod would be king. And in Acts 13, we find at Antioch, a man named Menaean, who is the grandson of Menachem, is counted amongst the members. Menaean was adopted by Herod in his youth and given a full Roman elite education in Rome alongside of that of Herod Antipas. So citing that from Acts 13, verse 13, Now there was in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and then Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, a.k.a. Paul. So Acts outright says that at the Antioch community at the Antioch church, which was, you know, if we read Acts, that's really like the home base, um, that this Menaean, the actual stepbrother of Herod Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch, was a member of the Jesus movement in this, in this Antioch community. So now we're seeing the Essene connection with the Herods, the Herodian family. So let's move on. Antioch, interestingly enough, was a major location of Herod the Great's architectural prowess as he built the famous colonnade therein. So this is a photo from Antioch. This massive, massive, incredible road was actually built by Herod the Great, Herod Antipas's father. So it's very interesting that Herod the Great's stepson, who was the grandson of an Essene, was 
a high up member of the Christian Jesus movement community in this very city. Paul also is of Herodian stock. You see in Romans 16, 11, greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. So it's clear that now the Herodian, now that the Herodian family and the elites of the Essene movement are at the forefront of Christianity's origins. Remember how I said to bear in mind that Tower of Mariumne. Well, here's where that becomes important. Because on that map, let me just go back to it. Let me just go back to it, so jog your memory. Okay? So that top pink line, you see Herod's Palace right there. Right above it, the terror, Tower of Mariumne, Herod Antipas's Palace, only just a little bit, not too far in the uh, northeast direction. And then directly south of all these things is that Essene Quarter um, and the location of the upper room where the Last Supper and Pentecost occurred. Okay? All right in the same general direction. Or same general vicinity. Okay, so let's go back to that final slide. What's even more telling is the name Miriam Magdalene. Okay, Mary Magdalene. And its congruence or its connection of the Tower of Mariumne. Why is this telling? So in Aramaic, which would have been the conventional language of the day, the name of this tower would have been Magdala Miriamne. The parallel pronunciation in Hebrew would read Migdal Mariumne. Herod, Herod's Hasmonean wife's name was Mariumne, for whom the tower was named. As an Edomite, Herod's claim to kingship was always contested. So by marrying the last daughter of the Hasmonean dynasty, it gave Herod really a feeling of a sense of legitimacy. So can there really be any coincidence that the most devout female follower of Jesus, the one in all four Gospels who was present at the empty tomb, would bear the same onomastic title as that of the structure dedicated to Herod's own bride, the one that granted him legitimacy. So there are also Jewish sources, and these are very credible Jewish sources in the tradition that state. Um, so for a little background, we know that there are four kingdoms found in Daniel, right? Um, in a couple of different ways, but... I'll go by the beasts of Daniel 7. So you have the lion with wings, Babylon, the the bear, which is Persia, Medo Persia, the four-headed leopard, which is of course Greece and its separation into four kingdoms after the death of Alexander, and then ultimately the really unspeakable beast, which is Edom or Rome. So in Jewish thought and Jewish understanding is Rome and Edom really morphed into the church. I mean, think about where the think about where the figurehead location of the church is. It's in Rome, right? The Vatican. Um, so one main reason why Christianity is Edom, according to these very, very reliable and very authoritative Jewish sources is because Christianity's earliest converts or earliest believers were Edomite converts who converted to Judaism. Edomites. So if one thinks about it, you know, we understand that the Herod's didn't go through, their conversion was basically faulty, you know, it wasn't, they were always, they were never looked at as legitimate rulers, uh, the conversions were never considered legitimate, so on, and the Herods were Edomites, they were Idumeans, born of Idumean slaves. Um, so it's interesting, as we dig into these Christian origins, and how the theology really comes from 
The theology really comes from the apocalyptic Essene side of Judaism, this Enochian mystical apocalypticism of the small in-group, a.k.a. the Sons of Light, versus the out-group, a.k.a. everyone else, the Sons of Darkness. So we see this mystical theology being adopted by the Christian Church, uh, and so much of what the Essenes even did is really adopted by the Church, such as asceticism, celibacy. Uh, we see Jesus talk about people be people becoming eunuchs for the kingdom, right? Uh, Origen, yes, it was Origen, took this so literally he actually castrated himself. Um, but we also have monastic Christian sects that really, really exploded in the 3rd and 4th century. And even further, you still have monasteries today. Uh, so cloistered asceticism, self-imposed poverty. Think about when Jesus, the rich man, comes to, the G comes to Jesus and says, you know, what must I do to be saved? I've kept all the commandments from my youth. He says, okay, then sell everything you have to the poor and follow me and suffer, right? Take up your cross and follow me. Which, which implies to suffer, self-imposed suffering. We have from those, so that's, that's quite literally self-imposed poverty, which the Essenes very much espoused. But taking up one's cross and following means to suffer as I suffer. And we, as I read in the beginning, we have that article on the Messianic hymns that the Essenes very much espoused suffering. And, and that suffering was really wrapped up into their belief and that the Messiah himself was meant to suffer. So we're seeing all these congruencies in the theology department, especially the, the Enochian side of things. The book of Jude actually quotes Enoch verbatim. So we're having congruencies there. But then on the other side of things, like I said, we, we find Paul, a.k.a. Saul, in that Antioch community. He has Herodian kinsmen, right? He comes from Herodian stock of the house of the Herods. Which is interesting because he claims to be a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. We don't need to get into all that, but if he does have Herodian kin, that kind of shoots that idea in the foot. Um, but we see him in the same community as Menaean, this, es this former Essene who was adopted by Herod the Great and is really considered the stepbrother of Herod Antipas. Um, so very high up, very high up people in the Herodian house working together here. And I've talked about this with Davon before on videos. Um, Paul, when he finally goes to Rome, is given some very lavish treatment. He's given like his own, basically his own guarded apartment at, near the house of Caesar. Uh, when he writes his letters, when he writes his epistles, he even, even includes greetings, right? The righteous of Caesar's household. You know, Caesar's household greets you. Which is very interesting. Very, very interesting. I have another show coming out of the... Really, it's called The Unholy Romans, which is... It's really the... How the Romans are portrayed as the... You know, spiritually superior group in the New Testament more often than not. And the Jews are really portrayed as blind, ignorant, and hypocritical. I mean, look at the Oxford Dictionary, the word Pharisee, the second definition, is a hypocrite or, you know, someone who believes in vain religiosity, right? That wasn't an accident. That's baked into the European post-Roman Western mindset that a Pharisee is the enemy. Um... 
So when Paul, another another example here is when Paul is said to be given orders from the high priest to go, you know, punish, kill Christians in an area that isn't under that high priest's domain, Damascus, which is Syria, who would have authority to do that? Well, the Herods. And if Paul is of the house of the Herods, they would have Archelaus at the time, Herod Archelaus, who would have been the the vassal king at the time. They would have the authority to go to Syria, Syrio-Phoenicia. The high priest wouldn't, but of course the Herods would, because they ruled over that area too. So it's all starting to come together that the the Herodian Roman prestige would have the ability to manipulate the literature, to manipulate who could be given the literature, because we do know from the New Testament, the Greek is very good. It's not something that just your lay Galilean fishermen would, would be acquainted with. It was clearly not necessarily... Super elite, but someone that has a decent Greek, Greco-Roman education is who is creating these these um, writings. So, thinking of that, who would have that? I mean, this Essene Menaean was given a full Roman education in Rome. The Herods, the house of the Herods. Paul, right? Tarsus. Tarsus was a central hub in the region for Greek philosophy so if these as i said about those jewish sources that pinpoint that the origins of the christian religion really start with faulty converts from edom if you're if you have this power as the herodian house you're already not being considered fully jewish you're all you're you're um Conversion is already being considered faulty. You really don't have legitimacy. What would be the most palatable way to, you know, create Judaism in your image, basically, is to take these mystical ideas. I, I included a slide earlier that in Essene ideology, they were very much about these trance-like visions and esoteric mystical things so you really create a i mean after the fall of the temple and you're you're creating these things to make a palatable palatable judaism for everybody you you bring something to the table that's all spiritual nothing physical the rituals don't matter um and that's exactly what you're seeing and you include that mystical spiritual hyper spiritual esoteric element to it which is very much pulled from this essene ideology and you add that with the herodian prestige and elitism and the influence they would have in the region antioch especially like i had mentioned and they make that their home base and you're really you're really you know in the meat of something very very well orchestrated here so that's really all I wanted to share with you guys is the Herodian and Essene connections as they as they relate to the origin of the Christianity, the congruencies, the clear Herodian fingerprint all over the New Testament, all over the period, and even all over the major players that are discussed in the New Testament, as well as the Essene theologies that were you know, wholesale adopted by early Christianity. So I hope that helped everybody. I hope that made some sense. I hope it's clear how the Herodians really influenced influenced the literature and influenced the um, major early players in this movement, Paul and the like I said, Menaean at Antioch is considered a teacher or a prophet. Um, so some higher up, higher up 
people related to related to the Herodian house, and like I said, Paul's greeting his kinsman, who is apparently of the Herodian house, also in his own letters, in his own writings. So these these um, letters were being passed about in the Herodian family. Um, and then the theological side of things. So you have the socio-political side of things being orchestrated by the Herods, just as the authoritative Jewish Jewish sources say that these the earliest the earliest practitioners of Christianity were Edomite converts, which the Herods most certainly were. But then you also have the theological, esoteric side of things and how they were going to make this religion palatable, but to over spiritualize it and diminish the role of ritual and the physical side of Judaism. Basically making this religion something you can totally do without the temple, of course, right? So, I mean, the Essenes were already not using the temple anyway and made the temple their community. We see that, you know, the body is the temple and, you know, going to the house of the Lord is going to church every Sunday and all these things that now the new temple is actually the community of believers itself. So we can we can see this and how the Essenes approach things, the Her- the Herodians and with Menaean you have that in, he's a higher up in Antioch, like I said. So you have that clear marriage there of hyper apocalyptic esoteric theology and Edomite, you know, uh, vassal Roman elitism creating this this brand new conglomerate. So I hope that made sense, everybody. Like I said, I have that next video on the Romans itself coming out, and that will tie directly into this. Um, but before we get, you know, before we finish up, uh, check that description out. Plenty of resources down there. My ebook, the Christian Coloring Book. If you want a copy, shoot me an email, rediscoveringgod22 at gmail.com. Um, Stuart Federos, Learn Hebrew in One Hour. Follow the link. And like I said, plenty of other resources. But, okay, everybody, this was the Exodus Project. I'm Steve Eisenhower. We'll see you next time.